Well, again, good morning, cadets. I am Craig Portwood, Associate Vice President for Alumni and Main Campus Operations, and I have the distinct pleasure of sharing the stage today with an authentic servant leader and patriot, retired Army Major General John F. King. He is a native of Mexico and is currently serving the state of Georgia as the Insurance and Fire Safety Commissioner. This is a position to which he was appointed in July of 2019, and in that moment became the first Hispanic statewide official in Georgia history. And his service in that role during that time led to him being elected to a full-time term on November 8th of 2022. He did retire as a major general in the U.S. Army following his final assignment to NORAD and U.S. Northern Command. King was the former commander of the 48th Infantry Brigade Combat Team and was deployed to Bosnia, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Africa. And he served as the military advisor to the Deputy Minister of Interior for Security for Afghanistan, which oversaw an agency of 96,000 police officers. Major General King also had an outstanding career in law enforcement, showcasing his desire to serve and protect his community. In those roles, he actively created opportunities for his constituents by building bridges and creating programs that brought the entire community together. And his career also includes assignments to both the FBI and DEA as a task force agent. I could probably keep going on and on about his lengthy career of public service, but all of them reveal his consistent qualities of humility, service to others, being solutions focused, and let's be honest, just a very deep desire to answer the call. So it is my pleasure to welcome Major General John F. King to this morning's Leadership and Engagement Series at Georgia Military College. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you so much. Course, I appreciate it. Right here, sir. Well, we certainly do appreciate you taking the time, and I know your busy schedule to come spend time with these fabulous cadets, uh, these young leaders at our Leadership Institute. We're going to give them some opportunities to ask some questions, but I told them I'd prime the pump a little bit. Great. Um, you've had a, a pretty remarkable career that is still ongoing as you continue to serve. And, and I think about you are such a demonstrated leader in so many areas, military, law enforcement, now, of course, public service as an elected official. So, so what do you see as the common theme of your leadership philosophy through all of those really has been it started with I think from very early on point of wanting to serve with others like me mm -hmm. a common theme of I want to be with those guys and gals and it became infectious after mm -hmm. uh, after a year or two I couldn't imagine leaving the company yeah. of these great people. Um, it, it's funny because I have a tie to, to Georgia Military College, and most people don't know this, but when I went to officer candidate school for the National Guard, we, went, we would meet at the Milledgeville Armory, and we would run every, for every meal to the cafeteria here. Okay. So every meal, 1985, I know. <laughs> Guys, can't, you, you're gonna have to Google it up. And it was, <laughs> but we used to run in, run through campus uh, in formation to go to the cafeteria and then return back to the armory. Okay. And for two years, uh, it was an OCS, uh, a National Guard OCS mm -hmm. program. But that was my first exposure to this great organization that that you all call home. Well, we are certainly thankful that our facilities are a little better than what you saw in 1985. <laughs> yes. The main barracks and the cafeteria in the bottom is, is not what it is today, I can assure you. <laughs> well, I, I love that idea of camaraderie I mean, and wanting to be part of something. I mean, you certainly modeled that in all that you have done. And, and I listened to an interview you did recently where you talked about hard work and, and your appreciation for that and then even seizing opportunities when they came to you. Kind of based on that idea, what, what counsel would you share with these young leaders with those same principles? I will tell you the, the one thing that I will say, don't shy away from the hard jobs. There's incredible, our army has incredible opportunities for 
young men and women who get the reputation of being the fixers. That you see a problem and you take responsibility for fixing it, for helping a fellow soldier. You get that reputation very early on. And going and seeking those hard jobs, the jobs that's like that people are like, oh, I don't want to do that because you got to wake up early in the morning or, you know, that's a hard job. You got to wait, you know, you got to go and, and, and be in the cold and the rain. Those are the jobs I will tell you you need to seek out because the greatest opportunity, the greatest experience you will get is going to be in those jobs. The cushy jobs that, that uh, they're out there and they're plenty. And there will be a time where you have to moderate your, your, your life and your career through those assignments. But seek out the hard jobs because once you get that reputation and that, you, you're building your kit, you, you, you're putting stuff in your, in your uh, rucksack that nobody can take away from you. You're that experience, um, you know, I, I, I have the opportunity that I started as an enlisted soldier in the 48th Brigade as an E2, and they finally kicked me out of the 48th Brigade as a brigade commander, as a colonel, 26 years later. And I didn't know anything, you know, it, the 48th Brigade was my, my organization. They're getting ready to deploy. They're starting to get ready to deploy to the Middle East again. And I'm a little heartbroken because they're going and I can't go with them. And, that, and so it's, it's that camaraderie, that relationship that you build. Mm. Well, I could ask questions all day because I'm enjoying this, but I want to give you young leaders an opportunity to do so. So I want to remind you, of course, that if you would please wait for the microphone to come to you. Make sure you tell us who you are, what type of cadet you are, and then you can launch into your question. So who wants to be the first cadet question? All right. Cadet Colonel Manlove. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm Cadet Manlove. I'm an ECP cadet. And my question is, with multiple deployments, how did it affect your family? It was tough. Um, it, it, there's always a cost. Don't ever let anybody tell you there's not a cost. Uh, in, uh, the, but the key, I will tell you, the key to this is communicating early um, when, when I married my wife, I was a soldier already. And so I, I shared with her what this commitment, how important it is, it was to me to, to serve. And then as soon as the indications were there that a potential was going to deploy, I started that conversation of preparing. Because you, just like you go through pre-deployment training, you also you have to prepare your family for deployment. And then, more importantly, when, you, when you're in deploy, you, you, you fight to maintain that contact and the communication and understanding what's going on back at home. But also, when you return, you can't just automatically come back and just assume your role and start do, making all the, you know, a lot of the decisions. You almost have to give yourself a little period of adjustment so your family can get used to you being back. Because remember, They've been making all the decisions while you've been gone. And for you to come and parachute back into your family and then decide, oh, I'm going to, you know. Um, I, so I, I almost, I developed this, almost what I call a battle drill, that as soon as I would come back, I would purposely not make any major decisions because I needed myself a, a period of adjustment. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of soldiers going and buying the, they have the motorcycle, they have the sports car because they got all this, all, you know, they got a little bit of extra money, combat pay. But that's very dangerous because your, your family also needs a period of adjustment. Uh, you got to reintroduce yourself to your kids. Uh, if you have children, it's, it's, it's a tough adjustment. And so it's, what I'm saying is this is a deliberate, you have to have a deliberate plan and you have to execute a deliberate plan of deploying and then also reintegrating with your family. And you also have to support your, your fellow soldiers who are going through their own struggles. Mm. And because in the Guard and Reserve, we come back to our communities. You have an incredible opportunity. In, in your generation that does so much social media, you can actually monitor the well-being the well of your fellow soldiers by how, how they're acting on social media and, and come in and support them when you see them that they're starting to head in a, in, in a, in a, in a tough spot. So hopefully I answer your question. Uh, I, I try not to tap dance, but that was a, that was a hard question. It, but uh, you made me think. 
hard about how, how I've done it. And don't get me wrong, I've never, it's not always been, I, the first deployment, it was, I, I was a wreck, because I just, you know, I just thought I was just coming back and time stopped back at home. And time does not stop. Life goes on back at home too. It was even harder, my son joined the Marine Corps. It was harder for me when I stayed behind and he deployed to Afghanistan. And I was, that was gut-wrenching. I mean, I, I, I was more stressed when he deployed than, than the multiple times that I deployed. But uh, yeah, I got, I got a dose of my own medicine on that one. But it's not easy. And, and I, I think you, you raised a couple of great points in that. It's understanding that as leaders and those that we lead, we are holistic creatures. And sometimes we get so focused on a task, and this is the job that I'm supposed to do, but our lives are not just one thing. You've got to think about all the pieces of who you are and how to balance that, and also recognize that those you lead have the same thing that they're going through. They have family issues. They have concerns about finances, and what are they going to do next, and how is this relationship working? And I think if we enter into that with a little bit of grace, and I think you, you're spot on having a plan when you come back into that is certainly going to be helpful. And, and know that if you get overly focused on the task and you disregard your family, you'll be out of balance. Effective, successful leaders in life have the right balance. And you can't forget that yeah. because it's important. That's great counsel. That's great counsel. Uh, who's got another question? Oh, Audrey, right back here. Sir, good morning. Uh, my name is Cadet Audrey Shirk, and I'm a Coast Guard Academy Scholar. I really appreciate how you talked about building um, camaraderie with your peers. What do you think is some advice you can give to young officers um, to build strong peer relationships with their fellow soldiers? It's, it is difficult, and I tell you, when you're first getting into a leadership position, especially when you're with peers, uh, it is tough to tell somebody who you're really good friends with that they're not, that th today is th they're not at their best. Mm -hmm that something is, that you have a shortcoming, that your uniform doesn't look right, that you, you need a haircut, you, you're looking kind of scruffy today. Uh, it's hard to tell that to friends. And so that's the initial, the initial struggle. And this is what I saw, especially with your, your younger colleagues that are going through the, through the, uh, through the prep school, that, that they're going through, they're learning, first of all, they're learning how to be, you know, what I call human beings. Right. And now they're telling people their own age, hey, you, you, need to square away. You, you need to square yourself up because you know, you're, you're not right. This is an advantage. The struggle that you're, that you're learning in, in these leadership gives you a leg up on all your peers across the nation. Because kids who are not in the, in the kind of program that you're in don't have those opportunities. And, there's, and you're gonna fail. And the key is, is you dust your knees off and you get back on it and you go back and try again. This is, this is your laboratory to learn these skills that will carry you for the rest of your life. You will, you will, you know, you will see when you see, you know, and I, and I see this because not only as a soldier, but as a policeman, I, I worked, I was a task force officer for DEA. And you, you, know, no, you don't have to grow a beard and, and, and look, you know, have tattoos on your face to be an undercover, you know, you know, I, 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 was, I had the opportunity to work for DEA and I passed, I, I posed as a banker doing money laundering uh, against uh, cartels in, in, in South America. So you don't have to, but I'll tell you, you, you learn to watch how humans carry themselves. And you can tell a soldier and you can tell a policeman, but mostly soldiers, you can tell just how they walk. They carry themselves differently. You will notice that as, as you, as in your roles, you're already acting different than your, than your peers. And you ought to be very proud of that because that's, people recognize that. And you walk in the door and they say, yep, that person has got their act together. And that gives you an incredible advantage. So take these opportunities to learn, to fail, to learn from others. You won't believe how much I learned by watching somebody else just, you know, Make an ass out of themselves. <laughs> like, man, I wouldn't have done that. You know, you, there's a lot of value in learning. Like, man, I don't know if I would have said that. Um, 
but learn. You, you, sh you should be a sponge right now. And there's nothing wrong with it. You know, it's just, you put, you, it, gives, it makes you better. Well, I think, you know, <laughs> to tie right into that principle, it, I think sometimes in, in learning, you're learning what to do and also learning what not to do. And both of those can be incredibly valuable. All right, who else has got a question? Ah, in the back. I already got a microphone. Good morning, sir. My name is Emily Faint. I'm a civic leader cadet, and I'm from West Point, New York. Mr. Portwood mentioned earlier that you were a fire safety commissioner. Can you explain what that means for those of us who don't know? That is a great question. You know, I, I first of all, the insurance commissioner in Georgia licenses every insurance company in the state, all the way from from homeowners to car to healthcare. I also license every agent that sells insurance. And I also approve every product that goes to market. But I also supervise the state fire marshal's office. So we approve every plan for, for fire safety, sprinklers, every major building, schools, jails. We have engineers that approve those plans. And so, as a, as a lifelong policeman and a soldier, when I became the, the state fire marshal, I had to cut down half of my jokes about firefighters because <laughs> firefighters and policemen are always at, at each other. Dude. So I had to be very sensitive about making fun of firefighters because we all know they're a very sensitive bunch. Of, they need lots of hugs. That was my plug for it. No. But, and it's an, ex, it, it's an incredible job because I, no, I have no insurance background. I got selected because I was a military officer and because my law enforcement experience. The governor asked me to serve because the previous insurance commissioner went to jail. He committed fraud, he's in jail. He's in jail for seven years for f defrauding the taxpayers of Georgia. And the governor asked me to serve and the first thing I asked, I told the governor, I said, Governor, I have no, I, I have, I have no experience in insurance. And he told me, and he was ready for this. He says, well, we've had a lot of people that had a lot of experience, and they haven't worked out really well for the citizens of Georgia. <laughs> I need somebody that will get this agency back in, on track to serve the, the, the citizens of Georgia. And as a military officer, you will never be in a job more than two to three years. As soon as you figure out what you're supposed to be doing, the Army will move you. And you'll be constantly, you'll become a, a, a master of organizational leadership, of a, a detecting where, where things could be improved, building on somebody else's success, or repairing the damage of, your pre, of a previous leader. And that's what, that's what military uh, folks do. Yeah, you don't get comfortable in a job. Uh, you, you, will, you will be moving to, every two to three years, you'll be taking, taking a new assignment that principle of transferable leadership skills. Absolutely, no matter what industry you're in, certainly gives you that opportunity. Yeah. And next time you're in an elevator, <laughs> just look for his name. It, <laughs> it, if you don't see my name on the elevator, take the stairs. <laughs> As my physical fitness pitch for, for, for the citizens of Georgia. So I, I expect to see some selfies later on just with you and the, and the signature of Commissioner King here. All right, who else has got a question for us? Oh, right over here. Morning, sir. My name is Daniel Park. I'm a ECP cadet. Uh, my question to you was, uh, how is the transition from becoming a military officer to law enforcement? Like, how is that for you, going from one really big organization to another? And also, are there any tips you have for somebody who wants to take that career path from military to law enforcement? Oh, I've been whining like a baby for, for months now. I've been retired now for four and a half months, and I miss it. I miss it terribly. I mean, you, I spent 42 years as a, as a soldier. And so uh, I'm trying not to be that, that whiny, you know, retired uh, officer that calls his, <laughs> his colleagues. And, um, but so I am now transitioning and being a cheerleader for this organization, for, for fellow soldiers, and going and advocating, and going in, in the things that I know that we need to do to support, you know, service members now in this role that I'm in and trying to influence, you know, in supporting. So I've I'm tra I'm transitioned uh, 
it has been a hard transition. I can't, I can't, uh, I still have all my, my uniforms hanging in my closet, you know, just in case, you know, I get the call. And, uh, and, uh, but, but so I'm transitioning to being a, a cheerleader for this great organization and the future leaders. I mean, my job now is, is to come in and figure out how do I support you as you embark in this great adventure that, that you're entering. Um, again, the trans, you know, to seek out opportunities. Believe me, I, five years ago, I was not dreaming at home of being, boy, I can't wait to be the insurance commissioner. I had no idea. I was a military officer, loved the, org I loved the, the, the unit and the, and, the, what, and the things that I was doing on behalf of our nation. I was a, a chief of police in a small community in Metro Atlanta area. I loved the company of, of policemen and, and the things that they do for our community. And then the phone, you know, I got a text message uh, and uh, the governor asked me to serve. And so that's why I'm doing this. So again, preparing yourself for that phone call that, that could come and be ready to jump on that opportunity. And, and you know what? You talk to your family, you discuss it for five, 10 minutes. And it's like, all right, let's do it. Mm. And so that's how I would, how I would offer. But yeah, I'm still whining about uh, not, not, not being uh, a soldier. <laughs> All right, question over here. I've oh, got one at the top. I already got a microphone. Go right ahead, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. My name is Carlos C. Fuentes. I'm from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and I'm an ECP cadet. My question for you, sir, is you say you're an enlisted man. How did that help you be a better officer to lead your troops, especially, you know, having that perspective of being a lower enlisted man? It, initially, it gave me a great advantage because I was an enlisted soldier in a tank unit. And really... The only reason I went to OCS is because at that, in those days, it was unit vacancy promotions. And so if nobody, moved, nobody left your unit, you weren't getting promoted. And so I said, I don't want to do this. So that's why it caused me to sign up for OCS, because I didn't want to be frozen as an E5. And so I went to OCS, and I realized it was a whole different world. And the opportunity to move and, and still serve around some great soldiers. But it gave me an incredible advantage um, when I went to officer basic course because I knew the technical piece. You know, I, I was a tanker. I went to, I went to armor school. And, uh, and so I, I already knew the technical piece of, you know, the, 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 of being an armor uh, soldier. And so then I had to just learn the leadership and the tactical parts of, 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 the, of the job description of being a, a platoon leader. And so it gave me a great advantage. And also at the end of the day, also it gave me a sense of humility that I knew that, that what those soldiers in the back of the formation at, at the, uh, at the uh, promotion ceremony or the change of command, what they were thinking, they were like, my God, just shut up. Let's move on, man. <laughs> That, that angry E4 mafia, I, I, was, a, I was a charter member of, of, of that organization. And, uh, but humility, humility was, was the mm -hmm. biggest thing. But I also knew um, that when you talk to soldiers, you need to look them in the eye. Because soldiers are, can get a little cynical. They're, they're crusties, especially non-commissioned officers. And you got to be able to look them in the eye and not shy away when, when they, they ask you or, they, or when they recommend, hey, Sir, have you thought about doing this? And, uh, and, and you got to look them in the eye and says, yeah, I thought about that. Or, you know, that's a great idea. Let's, let's, let's go with that. And, and give them credit. They, they will always, remember, when, as, a, as a second lieutenant, and you go in and to a, be a platoon leader, if you think about it, you're the least trained individual in your platoon. You're the newest member. Everybody there has got more time probably than, than, than you do in, in the skills. You know, if you're a platoon leader, you're the least trained armor soldier when you get to the platoon, but you are the leader. And everybody that has been in, in the formations will always remember their first platoon sergeant. I mean, it's Rudy, uh, Sergeant First Class Rudy Jefferson. He was my platoon leader in 1985. And you remember the good ones, and you remember the, the, the ones that weren't so good. But every, every, every successful leader down will always remember that special relationship you have with your first platoon sergeant, because he's helping you get trained. And so it, it's all about maintaining that balance. You're the leader. There's no excuses. 
if the unit fails or doesn't achieve its goals, it's going to be your, your, your fault. And how do you learn from that? And how do you do better the next time? And so I'll offer you that. And you hit a key word, I think, the, the idea of humility, just recognizing that everybody has something to offer. You know, I've, I've heard it said that you don't want to be the smartest person in the room. And if you are the smartest person in the room, you're, you're in the trouble. wrong room. You're in trouble. <laughs> so it's, it's time for you to go to another room because there is always somebody you can learn from at a different stage of life. Um, I'm, I'm sure our commandant's team could tell you that they've learned from you, that there are things that they pick up from you. And just that willingness to soak that up is a key mark of a growing leader. Other questions? Oh, got another one right here in the back. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, I'm Cadet IE, and I'm a state service and ECP cadet. My question to you was, as a, long, as a lifelong officer and a soldier, what was the hardest part of both careers? And how did you keep yourself from internalizing the issues that came on the job? And how did you put them aside whenever you go home to cater for your family? That's a great question. Nobody's ever asked me that. And I will tell you, having two, two roles as a soldier and as a policeman, changing my focus from dealing with law enforcement issues and frustrations and that, and then knowing that I had to go to drill, or I had to go on, on to school or annual training in the military, helped me turn that switch off and turn something else that it would focus and get my attention. It, 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 so that balance back and forth really helped me because I, then I realized that it's like, you know what, that problem that, that I have in the law enforcement or those problems with law enforcement will still be there when I come back. And so they're not as much of an emergency and then focus on the military and making sure I maintain my military educational you know, opportunities, going to, to command and general staff, to officer basic, officer advanced course in those days. And, and focusing back and forth helped me maintain that balance. And, and ha not having your friends and the people that you associate, having soldiers were part of my life to balance out all, my friends in law enforcement was good because it, there's a danger when all your friends all look like you and they all have the same interests that you have. And you can get out of whack with that. And so having that balance really, really helped me, you know, you know, keep, keep, and also probably the most important is having a sense of humor. You got to laugh because if you don't laugh, there's some funny things that happen not only in, in, I mean, you know it, you, 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 there's things that happen in the barracks, in the classroom, like, and it happened on the streets uh, that help you, you know, that you got to embrace humor. Humor is, is, is a great way to relieve stress. So I'll offer you that. Great question, great answer. All right, another question. Right down front here. Good morning, sir. My name is Eli Backus. I am a West Point scholar. And my question for you today is, what are some of the skills that have allowed you to not only be successful in progressing through the military, but also moving forward past your military career? Uh, I would offer you, the, again, the transferable leadership skills and adaptability. I mean, I had no, I had no, uh, had no knowledge, really, the really background in insurance, and now I'm your insurance commissioner. I got elected for a full full year term. I deal. We bring more revenue to the state of Georgia than every other agency except for the 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 uh, revenue department. So we we support every community in Georgia, um, and I forgot how much money we just bring to 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 Baldwin County, but but but. Being a student of organizations, student of human behavior, and being an adaptive uh, leader transfers to, and then also, um, there's hardly any community, I've been a policeman for 30, about 30 years now, there's hardly any community in Georgia that I can't pick up the phone and talk to a sheriff or a police chief that I've known. The relationships that you're building here Will, will carry you. You'll be able to pick up the phone. 
you can be in Korea, you can be in, in, in anywhere in Europe. Hey, let me check on my old classmate. And these are relationships. This is the difference between you get a call in the middle of the night and say, hey, man, I need help, and, and you're in a combat zone. This is the difference a lot of times, and you're establishing a level of trust here with, you, with your colleagues. There's a difference between I'm on my way, tell me what your ops plan is when I get there. Or, well, send me the ops plan, I'll have the lawyers look at it. When you don't have trust, that's what happens. But when you have, you develop a reputation of being a doer, those, those transfer for, through for the rest of your career, and they transfer also to your civilian career. Um, I'm not a politician, and now I'm running around the state of Georgia eating barbecue, fried fish, and kissing, you know, holding pigs, you know, <laughs> as part of... But at the end of the day, I'm known as, yeah, King is, King is a straight shooter. He will do the right thing. And, and that's, that's what you're working. You're building that resume for yourself. I think it speaks so much, too. I mean, it, it is important what you know but even more so who you know and the connections that we make throughout. I mean, we see it right now with our president, Colonel Kraft and General King, having served together in that camaraderie that has carried them throughout all of these years. And I don't think any of the three of you would have predicted, hey, let's meet in Milledgeville <laughs> yeah. in 2023. Let's, let's do this. To... But yet here yeah. you are. That's correct. Other questions? Uh, right over here on this side. Yes, sir. Morning, sir. My name is uh, Alejandro McCabe. I'm a Naval Academy scholar. My question to you is, when making tough decisions, what keeps you anchored? And then what is your decision-making process when going through those? So how do you stay like level-minded? You know, you, you, that's, a, that's a really good question, especially in the, in the time and place where you all are. Eventually, I mean, the way the world is, um, we didn't think, you know, when I first came into the Army, we were coming out of, you know, post-Vietnam. We were uh, involved in the, in, the, in, the, you know, the Cold War. And I really never saw, I mean, we trained. This is how wacky it is. As an armor officer, we trained how to deploy to Europe to fight in the Fulda Gap against the Soviet invasion of Europe. And then I spent the majority of my adult life fighting in insurgency. And guess what we're doing now? <laughs> we, we're getting retooling, bringing the tanks back, and it's cool to be Arbor again. <laughs> where, where you, you know. and, and so, cyclical. And, uh, and you know what? When you're in the combat, especially when you, 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 know, you train a unit, you deploy to, a com to combat, everybody will look at you. And, and your soldiers are assessing, uh, can this guy or this gal keep me alive and bring me back home? And you got to balance. You got to make some tough decisions. That's why you're in a, an incredible opportunity to learn the leadership principles. The whole issue, for example, you know, a lot of people are like, as a, as a junior leader, says, why do we spend so much time dealing with fraternization? Being too, you know, when you're in a leadership position, you have to be one step back because the rest of the soldiers are looking and saying, oh, is he going to give the safe missions to his friend or is he going to give me? And it's about competency. It's about, and so a lot of times you got to look at, because fear is an incredible, it, it fear is an incredible, you know, uh, affects units. It affects different people differently. And you sometimes you even though you're feeling the same level of fear and, and trepidation that, that the, your, your soldiers are, and you have to reach way down and you say, "I can't let my soldiers down." I, even though I'm scared that we're going to go back out on mission and we're probably going to get you know engaged, I still have to reach that deep down because I cannot I cannot fail my my, my soldiers. And you carry this responsibility. I, I tell you guys, I. Um, even today, I mean, I was a battalion task force commander in southern Baghdad. And to this day, I, I still carry the burden as a leader of six of my soldiers killed in action. One of them, a graduate from the school, Stokely. Mm. He's one of mine. I'll carry that burden for the rest of my life. In 87, of my, uh, my soldiers wounded in action. 
and I have to travel around Georgia and look at their families and look at those you know, broken, young broken soldiers. And I got to make, not allow them to ever have a doubt that they had somebody that loved them and cared, even when we, I ordered them to have tough missions. And it's no other, no other group of young men and women will have the burdens and the challenges that you all are facing. None of your colleagues in, in the regular, you know, regular schools will ever experience the things that you're learning today. And that makes you special. Um, and so I'm very proud. I'm pr 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 very proud of all my soldiers. But uh, you got to conquer. You got to conquer the doubt, the self-doubt, the, the fear of failing. Because that makes you tougher and makes you stronger. And you just, you know, like my old young infantryman used to say, you just got to embrace the suck. You know, it's just, there's power in that. Believe me, there's power in that. And, and I think you make a, you talk about the, taking that step back. I think leaders learn to zoom in and zoom, zoom out. out. You have to be able to do both to be an effective leader. That sometimes you're getting close on some details, and other times you've got to take that step back to see the whole picture to make sure you're not missing something as you make those decisions. And, and let me add this to you. You are not alone. You're never alone. You know, if you're a leader, you have an NCO, a sergeant major, a, a first sergeant. That is your partner. When we, when we relieve leaders in the military, we relieve command teams. We don't relieve just one person. That NCO, that sergeant major has a duty to look in the eye. That's the last person I used to talk to before I made a tough decision. I looked at my sergeant major. And I, and I was looking, okay, Sergeant Major, am I, am, my own, am my own solid footing here? Am I missing something? And the, my Sergeant Major's job is to look me in the eye and say, sir, I think you're jacked up. Or, sir, you're good. And rely, there's a special relationship between an officer and their non-commissioned officer that is unlike, no other military in the world has a, a relationship with, between officers and non-commissioned officers that the American Army has. And we try to teach it. it is, but it's a hard concept for other, even our allies, to, to understand that. Mm. Mm. All right, we have time for one more question right here in the middle. So I get worried when you guys stand up and you have a notebook. It's like, That's my right. God, I really <laughs> thought hard about this question. Good morning, sir. Good morning. My name is Gabby Brown. I'm an ECP cadet. And what advice that you could um, possibly give us future leaders that can help us as we go forward with our military career? I'm so sorry. Can you, can you repeat the, fir the first part of your question? What advice that you could um, possibly give us future leaders that can help us as we go forward with our military career? probably going to go back to the themes of adaptability. Mm -hmm. Seek out opportunities, and don't be shocked when your strategy for seeking those opportunities works. Constantly prepare yourself. If I get the call, I want that job, and if I get the call, I am ready. You have to mentally, physically, and emotionally prepare yourself for those jobs that you want. That if you want to be an S3, I'm going to I'm going to do the, I'm going to have the foundation that if I get the job, if I get to be an assistant three and the, and the S3 catches the flu or, you know, does something, if I'm the assistant S3, I'm ready to take that job, that I'm ready to be the XO, that I'm ready to be, you know, that mentally and emotionally prepare yourself. So when, if you get that opportunity, you're, you're ready. There's no hesitation because I'll tell you, I've seen a lot of folks that just, well, you know, they're just doing the tap dance. Go in with it with both feet. And it's like, hey, I'm ready. And even if, even if you, if, even if you, it, even if you take a stumble, dust yourself out, get back on it. People will judge you, not just when everything is going well. People will judge you how you handle disappointment, when you, how you handle failure. A lot of times I, I, I assess my junior leaders when, when I chew them out, when I did this, like, hey, man, you totally screwed this up. I watch how they behave. 
and I really look at future leaders in my organization for the ones that said, yes, sir, I screwed up, no excuses, I will do better next time. Instead of the one that goes and whines and starts sucking their thumb and gets in the fetal position <laughs> in, in the back of the room. Be ready for, for that opportunity and jump with it. You make a, a great point to end on, the idea that it, it's easy to lead when everything's rosy. <laughs> when everything's right, yeah. When everything's rolling along, you just, oh, I just sit back and enjoy and this. True leaders make their mark and learn the most when they lead through difficulty. Well, sir, in your incredible career, you've certainly demonstrated remarkable leadership, are continuing to do so as you serve our state, for which we're thankful. We're certainly grateful for you taking time to spend with us today. So let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you all so much.